everyone as you're gathering this morning. Welcome everyone as you're gathering this morning to our third and final week of our Alliance uh, Volunteer Education Series. And we've been working on the theme, Expanding Your Comfort Zone, Where the Magic Happens. So uh, each week as we've been joining in, we've asked people to just introduce yourselves in the chat. So if you would please do that again today, open up your chat box and put in your name, where you're coming from today, and then I have some questions for you to think about, um, you know, especially reflecting back on our discussion so far. Is there anything that you've heard from other volunteers that you would now like to try? Something maybe that you haven't done before. Um, also might think the about- Norse, Laconia, New Hampshire. Thank you. And I am gonna invite everybody to open up your it's chat pleasure. and to put that in the chat box so everybody can see that as well. Uh, and I'm gonna post some questions there so that you can see them. So nice to see people as they're coming in today. Okay. So here's some questions to reflect on. Um, what does taking risk look like? And how might you see yourself stretching into something new? So it's great. Um, I can see we have folks from all over. Rochester, Concord, Vermont, Guilford, Laconia, Peterborough, Ashland, uh, Pemmy Baker Hospice, Ackworth, Manchester, Plymouth, Swansea, Keene, Concord, Cornerstone Hospice, Tufts, uh, Campton, New Hampshire, Eaton Center, New Hampshire. These are things I'm going to have to go look up on the map. I don't even know where those are. Uh, Surrey, New Hampshire, Hooksit, Chelmsford, Mass. So we have three states with us today. That's great. Wolfboro. Um, so again, if any of you have thoughts about, um, is, is there something that you've heard from our previous two series, something that you've heard volunteers talk about that, that you might like to try, something new that you haven't done before? Or is there any way that you see yourself stretching as a result of these discussions we've had? Oh, so Catherine, that's great. Catherine's saying that she is thinking about stretching. Um, currently, she's a certified music practitioner, so she's offering music, but she's thinking about stretching to being a companion visitor also. So that's exciting that you've been inspired to maybe try something new. And Beverly says that she might like to try end of life vigil. So also very exciting to try something new. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Oh, and Sally, um, looks like she has been inspired to sign up for the death doula course at UVM. So we did have a speaker talk about that. That's great, Sally. I've known a number of people who've gone through that course and they've gotten a lot out of it. So again, as you're coming in, this is our third week uh, for expanding your comfort zone where the magic happens. And if you wanna open up your chat box, you'll be able to see all of the people who are joining us today. Um, Leslie, I can't see our numbers. How many do we have so far today? I have to unmute myself. So I believe we have 189 signed up for okay. today. But I know a lot of those folks will be joining the recording a little you know, later on. To yeah. right now we have about 60 people on the line. That's excellent. Great. So um, I think that we might just go ahead and get started. We'll keep admitting people as they come in. And um, I'm just curious, maybe by a, a show of visual hands, uh, how many of you have attended at least one other session during this series? Great. 
So there's been a lot of repeat. That's wonderful that you're making use of these. And if not, um, there is the opportunity to go back and view the recordings from earlier in the series. And we'll make sure to share those recordings in a follow-up email too. So today we're going to start with a session that we're calling Close to the Edge, Cultivating Space That Can Hold More of Everything. Uh, so what we're looking at is how can we as hospice volunteers learn to cultivate an inner space that is big enough and deep enough to hold the experience of each person we come in contact with, even when and especially when those people are different from us. So uh, today we're going to be using this beautiful and thought-provoking film that was created by Joseph's House in Washington, DC. And we're going to be using this as a springboard for our discussion. So this particular film actually features an inpatient hospice house. It is in a different part of the country, but the topics that are brought up in this film are relevant to any setting. Great. Inviting us to take risks, face our fears, and meet the people we serve with our own humanity. It challenges us to develop our individual and collective capacity to hold space, allowing that each person in hospice may be truly seen and find a place of belonging. So I just wanna to mention too, that you do have a link to this video in your invitation. I think you received that and it is online at the Alliance site. And in the follow-up, we'll make sure to give you the link for the video too. Um, if you're like me, watching this once will not be enough. Uh, it's, it's a true gem and there are things that I heard the second time that I didn't hear the first time. It's one of those. So you may very well find yourself wanting to go back and revisit the film later. So uh, Leslie, would you go ahead and set that up for us? I will. Thank you. All right, so is uh, broadcasting and broadcasting. So let's uh, hope it. Yep. Anya, can you see that? When people come here, we really, um, we really don't know sometimes whether they will live or die. And, and yet it's a home and we make it a home and we celebrate, we celebrate life and we, uh, we go the distance and um, walk someone all the way to the very threshold of death. I guess it's the essentialness of it all. There's so little bullshit here. And um, I think it's because of being perched right on the edge of life and death. And that when, when people are so sick, there's so little time. When a person's time to die comes, our staff and volunteers learn um, almost to pace their breath with the breathing of the person who is dying. It's almost as though the breaths are steps and we're, we're together. And in that way, I'm, as I can, going the distance with this man, this woman, this person who feels like a friend. I don't need anything from them. I don't need my hand squeezed. I don't need, um, thank you for being here. I don't need anything. All we need is, is what we have. And that's, this person is breathing. I'm breathing. We're breathing together. We're, to, we're together. We want to be welcoming. We want to deepen in love. We want 
uh, someone who comes to live with us not to have to be uh, a nice, gentle person. We want to welcome the person who's most in need. And, and that could be someone who's um, really suffering and really angry and re we don't know how, how we're going to communicate with them or how we're going to communicate our love. The very first thing they're looking for is comfort from their physical pain. Um, we can give that. And once that is, is largely satisfied, they're looking for um, respect and affection. I think it's affection. And, um, and a good way of, of saying that is being seen. And to be seen takes time. When the collard greens are boiling on the back of the stove, the aroma says to the person who can, um, can hear the pans rattling in the kitchen and knows what's on the, on the stove, it says home. It's familiar. The setting of the table with all of the people who, who can come to the table and who are helped to the table, it's much more than eating. It's finding one's place. It's having a place, it's inhabiting a place, it's belonging. That sense of having a place, uh, for most people I think, begins at the table and then kind of extends to uh, a broader sense of having a place within Joseph's house or within the, the community of Joseph's house. It's pretty different for middle class, mostly white, young people just graduated from college to be caring for um, mostly African-American, poor, probably recently homeless, people that their parents would have warned them to stay away from if they were walking down the street, you know. In, in other circumstances, they, would, they each would avoid each other. The fact is that here, here they meet and sometimes fall in love. Here, here they meet and um, when one person dies, he is mourned, he's missed, he's changed this young, young girl's life or this young man's life. In, in relationship, um, Great humanity has been able to, to flourish in such ordinary, simple, barely noticeable ways, except for that both people are different, are changed. Two people can begin to change the, the culture anywhere um, and, and in, in a way invite mystery in, in, in a way invite bigger purpose in, in a way, in, become more aware of grace and mystery. It's not our way to help people defend themselves uh, against being hurt or grieving, or um, experiencing fear. We want to cultivate um, within each person and within our community um, a bigger inner space, a, a little deeper inner space that can hold more of everything, including love. And so when love happens, and, um, and it does often, and the person dies, and he's mourned, um, or and our hearts break. That means that the heart is more open 
and open to the next person who comes to live here. In the real world out there, um, it's, it's more of a habit to protect oneself from fear and from failure and from unknown, from taking risks, certainly from taking the risks of love, uh, to, from taking the risks of forgiveness or asking forgiveness. But here we just practice those things and it, it feels a little roomier and there's a little more possibility here. We practice cultivating a space where people can tell the truth and believe that their truth will be held, uh, will, will be trusted and will be respected, will be held in confidence, that one won't be judged. That's a real family. It's a real mature, maturing group of people who practice that, who practice that. Mm. All right, I trust that that worked. <laughs> Oh, you're, ta you're muted, Tanya. It did. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> How incredibly rich, huh? I almost want to leave some silence there just to let that kind of settle in because there is so much. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, break out into some smaller groups so that we have the opportunity to discuss what we've seen. And, and to think about how it impacts our own practice with hospice volunteering too. Um, I want to ask that if possible, I, I know that I saw someone who was having difficulty with their camera, but if possible, please do turn your camera on to participate in the group and please do participate as fully as you can. I think we're gonna break into groups of six or seven and we're going to have about 20 minutes to have a conversation. So I wanna give you enough time to actually delve in a little bit and not just get started and have to be pulled back into the larger session. Um, so when we come back, we will have a, a chance to do a little bit more sharing and wrap up around the film. So I would invite you to think about this, a couple of ideas there of how do we hold space for people? How do we cultivate that place that she's talking about? And there was a line in there that said, it's not our way to protect or defend people uh, against grief or pain or taking risk. And as I think about that comment, creating this space where all of those things might exist, that she's not only saying that our clients or our patients are in that space, but also the hospice caregivers are in that space where there's a, a mutuality, a vulnerability, a holding space for each other. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and break out and have a, a very wonderful discussion and we'll come back in 20 minutes. All right, so just to recap, I'm going to put you into groups of six or seven. And you're going to discuss that cultivation piece, hopefully. It works. If you get broken out and there's no one in your group or it doesn't work, you can click return to main session and I'll try harder. Um, I can't um, I, I can't control where people go and I can't control who gets broken up. So if, if you don't if you're not in the ability to to join a group, you're driving or whatnot, just click return to main session and uh, I can try again. OK, here we go.
Pamela, did you want to be in a group? Sorry, uh, your mucus, mic is muted. I didn't hear you. Doesn't matter. Oh, okay, I definitely do. Let's see. We you should have something that says join group nine i do awesome click yes <laughs> right. uh janet did it get bump you out okay let's get you put back in a room sorry about that that's okay. I got. I don't. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna send you a link. And with any luck, let's see. There you are. Okay. Just if you see a uh, room six, just take it. All right. Okay. Or five. Sure. Whatever. Five. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. See, oh, hey, Fazia, you probably don't want to join a group, so you can just see where you're at. Yeah, hi, Leslie. Good morning. I just wanted to know what what time am I scheduled for? Um, eleven, I believe. Okay, right. That's not the time that I oh, had. What do you have? I think, um, I thought it was supposed to be. Um, seven, I'm seven thirty. You're. Are you guys Eastern Standard Time? Yes. Um, so I thought it was supposed to be twelve thirty. Oh. Okay. It's it's fine. I'm it here. I just have a hard stop. Like I have to be done at your twelve thirty. Exactly. Ours is ends at twelve thirty. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, yeah. so I guess um, yeah. I think we are. I think I have you as. Let me let me just get these last couple of people in there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not here. Us. I'm not going to go anywhere. All right. Great. <laughs> uh, Carolyn, if you see. Um, a move to room two, just accept that. Okay. Anybody else is signed? Looks like, I don't know why, Lisa, I'm not able to move you. If you see a, a pop-up that says come to a room, just grab it. Um. I'm taking, I'm, our auditors are oh, here, our CMS oh, yeah, auditors yeah. are here, so I'm, I yeah. prefer not to be in a group, but I'll be on the call, so sure. when they come back, I'll jump back on. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I think that's everybody. All right, um, and then Lisa's actually, Lisa, if you're there, you're the person to ask, do you remember what's in our email? What is the exact start time for Fazia about? Um, I have... 1045 to 1215. So that's on the paper that I have here. That makes sense. So what another is 20, another 20 minutes? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. Yeah, 20 minutes. Okay, I'll be I'll be here. It'll be in and out. That's great. Thank you very much for your flex. No problem. And um, I just want to tell you, it's pronounced FISA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bye. Uh, okay thank so you i'm i'm gonna be back and i'm here leslie i'm gonna just stay logged on so i don't lose the connection or anything thank you yep um and i'll um come back in about 10 minutes is that okay yeah yeah absolutely okay all right Hey, Siri, is that a timer for 15 minutes?
Hey, Jane, we are in breakout session. So if you can um, select accept room seven as your assignment. Thank you. Welcome back. Little breakout rooms are closing and people are popping back into the main session here. Um, as you come back in, you will automatically still be unmuted. So if I can't find you, I'll ask you to mute me not. What's that? I'll ask you to mute me so let's go ahead and mute yourselves um, as you return to the main session that automatically defaults to yeah. unmuted. So welcome back, everybody. I hope that you had some great discussions. I had a really lovely group and really appreciated the topics that came up. I'm gonna invite you again to just open that chat box. And um, we're gonna do literally just about two minutes here of, of wrapping up. I'm curious, uh, anybody who wants to share something that was particularly salient, something that particularly resonated or that your group had a, a discussion around, if you wanna drop that in the chat box, or if you want to unmute and share something briefly, that would be okay too. I just want to share um, something that Terry had said that I actually wrote down when we are doing our hospice duties here is she mentioned the three H's, helping, hearing, or hugging. That just kind of resonated, made me want to write it down to remember it. That was a great little tip to walk away with in the toolbox. Thank you, what was what was the last word that you you stated? Hunt, hunting, hugging. Was, so she's, go ahead. Go. It it was helping, hearing, or hugging. And hugging. Okay. Right to figure right. out what the person was in need of at that time. 
Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, in our session, I want to touch, as we all know, touch is probably the one of the last sensations that, according to what my understanding is, touching is there's a there's something there that still works even though the person uh, um, may no longer be verbal or or cognizant of your awareness they there's a i've heard that and i've sensed it too when i touch there's a there's a movement there's some kind of reaction some kind of response so yeah i that that is something um I think that is important. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. I just want to call out what people have shared in the chat. Um, Sally mentioned that she was particularly moved by the quote, when was the last time you stood still enough to really see someone? And Cheryl mentioned that, that um, going in with no expectations and being open to whatever may happen couple other comments here. Being with someone as they are dying is a blessing for both the person who is dying and the hospice volunteer. And Donna said, we are rewarded by helping others feel rewarded. So I want to thank you all um, for joining into that film. And again, invite you to go back and revisit it later if it's something that spoke to you. We're going to be switching gears now. And I have the privilege of uh, introducing our next speaker. Uh, so our next speaker is Faiza Benzent, and she is the Executive Director of the Council for Certification and Volunteer Administration. With over 20 years of leadership experience and volunteer engagement, she continues this work with a goal of centering community amongst the profession, improving equity and access to volunteerism, and increasing diversity amongst professional volunteer, leaders of volunteers. In 2018, Ifiza published her first children's book entitled, My Mama Wants to Eat Me Up. As a mother of two young boys, she has not actually eaten any of her children. So Ifiza, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Tanya. Um, it's wonderful to be here. And as Tanya said, my name is Faiza and I am with the Council for Certification in Volunteer mm -hmm. Administration. Um, I wanted to take a second just to thank uh, Ren Anderson for inviting me to be here. Uh, Ren has a had attended one of my ethics webinars previously and thought that it would be a really good session um, for this audience. So. I wanted to say thank you, Ren, and I also just wanted to say thank you to all of you for making the time uh, to be here today. Um, two things I just want you to know off the bat is that you will get a copy of all of these slides um, after the session, and you will also get a copy of two uh, handouts that I'm gonna be talking about throughout the session as well. So don't feel like you need to take too many notes or anything like that. I encourage you just um, to take the time just to listen and I will leave some time at the end of the session for questions. But I like to present in a way that's very informal. So if you have questions in the middle of the presentation, please feel free to come off mute and just ask a question or put your question in the chat box and we'll address those questions as we go. So kudos to all of you um, for including the topic of professional ethics especially because it's not a subject that we talk about or that we focus on very often in our work. And it's my pleasure to share this information with you on behalf of CCVA, that's the acronym for the organization I work for. Um, we have been the home for the professional ethics in volunteer administration uh, for many years. Um, and as I said, there's gonna be two handouts related to the session that I'm gonna refer to as I go through the slides. And they're going to be available after uh, they'll be emailed to you after the session so what i'm going to be talking about today are the professional ethics for leaders of volunteers in volunteer engagement some of you might be leading volunteers some of you are volunteers yourself but all of this information can be applicable in your work um, and in your daily lives so very quickly just to start the council for certification and volunteer administration our vision is 
a world where competent, passionate leaders effectively engage volunteers. And our hope is to advance excellence in the leadership of volunteers by offering a professional certification. So there are leaders of volunteers that have what's called the CVA credential, which stands for Certified in Volunteer Administration. And we also do what we're doing today, which is advocating ethical practice. We have about 1,100 CVAs across the world. If you have a CVA designation, you've demonstrated your competency um, in seven unique areas. So if you are a volunteer and one of your uh, volunteer managers or director of volunteers has their CVA de designation, they've demonstrated competencies in these areas that you've seen on the screen. And if you're interested in learning more about the CVA designation, we have info sessions almost every month on our website, um, which is listed here. So I'm gonna start this webinar and I'm gonna end this webinar and we're gonna to get to know Lynn. So Lynn is the director of volunteer services at a hospital. At the height of the um, uh, pandemic, she was asked by her senior management to organize a COVID-19 vaccination clinic for volunteers based on her government's current phasing criteria. The vaccination supply was not guaranteed. While determining which volunteers met the current age and medical criteria, Lynn was approached by the vice president of development and he instructed her to invite one of the hospital's largest donors, Mrs. Smith, to be vaccinated. When Lynn responded that the clinic was for current volunteers, the VP said, oh, well, Mrs. Smith has dedicated lots of time to causes on behalf of the hospital. and We don't want to disappoint her. Lynn knew that Mrs. Smith didn't meet the current age requirement for vaccination and wasn't sure of her medical background. So what do you think Lynn should have done? I'm going to take you through today um, an ethical framework. I'm going to take you through a decision-making process when you're faced with an ethical dilemma and a couple of different tools. So keep Lynn in mind and we're going to come back to Lynn at the end um, and use the tools that we've just talked about to, to, to break down what it is that um, that Lynn did. So this is actually a real case study. Uh, the person who went through this case study is not actually named Lynn. We changed her name for the purpose of this case study, but this is a real case study and I'll, I'll explain to you at the end what Lynn actually decided to do um, in this situation. So first, a little bit of uh, historical context about um, all of this work. Um, ethics has, is something that's been talked about for centuries, but it's only been um, during the last, um, sorry, my camera keeps going in and out. Give me one second, right? Can you still see the screen? Okay, thank you. I see your head nodding, Leslie. Okay. Um, if some, if Leslie, I can see you on my screen. So if I cut out or anything, just I'll be looking at you to to let okay. me know. Okay. Look good. All right, so first I just want to start with a little bit of background on the topic of ethics, just so that you can understand uh, where this fits into all other disciplines and um, and how it applies to the work that we do in, with communities today. So ethics has been talked about and written about for centuries, but it's only been during the last 50 years that it's been connected to volunteer uh, volunteerism. It's one of the defining characteristics of any profession and the first statement of ethics in volunteer administration was developed in the 1970s. And it was a way for practitioners to signal to their colleagues and their organizations that they took this work very seriously. So if you can imagine, you know, directors of volunteers and hospitals or hospices working um, side by side with other medical professionals that had that also have ethical codes of conduct. It was a way for us in our profession to say, you know, we've got one too. Um, so this first document that was developed in the 1970s um, was later updated and revised by the Association for Volunteer Administration, which, is, which was called AVA. And it was based on the work of Michael Josephson, an international expert in the field of ethics. Unfortunately, AVA as an association had to dissolve in 2006. And so to preserve the work related to ethics in volunteer administration, the ownership of this material was transferred to CCVA. That material was updated again in 2016 to just to make sure that it remains relevant and usable. Um, and it's, it's, due to, it's due to be revised again. I wanna say hi if there are any CVAs that are here today. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the CCVA Council, we sponsor an international credential in volunteer administration. And anyone who is applying for the credential has to affirm their commitment to professional ethics. And every five years when they renew their credential, they have to affirm their commitment to professional ethics again. So at CCVA, we strongly encourage practitioners to apply an ethical lens when working with volunteers. However, we don't play an enforcer role um, of these principles. What we wanna do is make sure that the information and tools on ethics and how to um, work through an ethical dilemma are available to practitioners in the field in a supportive way, just to encourage all of you to make ethical decisions. So let's consider the word ethics, okay? How would you define it? For me, it's something, um, I know what I mean when I use it, but it can be hard to explain to others. It can feel complicated, especially when you have differing beliefs um, or different values, and especially when we all have a different life experience as well. On the screen, you see some of the other words that are often used when we are talking about or thinking about ethics. Some of those words, like for example, morals and beliefs, are more associated with individuals. And then some of those other words like culture, policies, um, and values, which can kind of go either way, are more applicable to groups and organizations. All of the terms represent important concepts and rules that we can't ignore when we're working together in community, but they might mean different things to different people. And that's where there can be confusion and overwhelm when it comes down to just a practical application of ethics. So I wanna start with a really simple idea, okay? Each of us carries an ethics backpack. You might carry a crossbody bag, somebody else might have a briefcase, for the purpose of today, I'm just gonna say a backpack, okay? So each of us carries an ethics backpack. Your ethics backpack is part of who you are and it influences how you behave and it's deeply personal and unique as it should be because you're deeply unique as well, okay? You and I might have the same contents in our backpack, um, but other content is gonna be really different, okay? Therefore, we can never assume that another's ethical backpack is the same as our own. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. Inside your ethics backpack, there's going to be three types of ethics. Um, some of you might have um, uh, other types of ethics. Your personal ethics could be, um, you know, informed by, by a few different things. So let's take a look at all of the different things that are in uh, our own ethics backpacks. Okay, um, let's start with our personal ethics. Okay, our personal ethics are just that. They, you know, for me, they are mine and they're very subjective. My personal ethics are my values and principles, and they're influenced by my history, they're influenced by my experience, my religious upbringing, um, my ethnicity and my culture. Um, and my personal ethics are what guides my immediate reaction to a situation. It's that internal voice that goes off um, when something happens that tells me, you know, this isn't right, this doesn't feel right, okay? And because of my personal ethics, doing the right thing, it might mean something different for me than it does for you. And we just need to acknowledge that. And, and that's just part of who we are. Organizational ethics, which are another part of our backpack, are a set of principles that govern the behavior of a group of people, right? Often these are called our code of ethics or our guiding values. And lots of organizations, not-for-profits or even businesses have these. Some of them have them posted on their website and they tell you what their values are, okay? The purpose of organizational values is to ensure a consistency of action rather than leaving it up to every person to behave by their personal ethics, okay? So sometimes we can join an organization as a staff person or as a volunteer, and we agree to abide by the rules or the code of conduct of that organization, okay? And that might be familiar to some of you and your onboarding, you're asked um, to do that. Your current organization may also have a code of ethics or values that's on your website or in your documents as well. And so you might want to take a look at those after today and just compare them to what we're talking about um, in today's discussion around ethics. And then lastly, are our professional ethics. And our professional ethics are the values and principles that apply to a very specific field of activity. So an obvious, obvious examples of, of those are, for example, doctors and lawyers, human resource professionals, for example, all have professional ethics. And so do uh, volunteer administrators. They define a foundation for practice that's universally acceptable no matter what the setting is, okay? 
So you may work with volunteers or be a volunteer in a sporting organization, in a hospice, in a performing arts center, at a local school. No matter what the setting, um, our ethics would be the same in when it comes to volunteerism. And this is the type of ethics that we're going to focus on today. Okay. So with all of this in our backpacks, is it any surprise that sometimes there's a conflict, right? Hopefully there's a great deal of overlap between the organizational, personal, and professional ethics. But if we encounter a situation where one of the values in one part of our backpack clashes with another value, sometimes we're faced with a really difficult decision, okay? And we, we ask ourselves, which ethics do we honor? Um, which ones can we compromise? And this is where ethical dilemmas occur, and this is why they can be hard to navigate. So now that we understand those three types of ethics in our backpack, I want to look more closely at the professional ethics for volunteer administration, um, engagement professionals, and also for the volunteers um, that they may partner with, like some of you. What this slide is showing you are five core values um, that are related to ethics in volunteer engagement. And I like to remember them with the acronym CRAFT, which stands for Citizenship, Respect, Accountability, Fairness, and Trust. And you might wonder where these came from and how they were decided upon. Well, they're based on a very well-known framework used by a lot of professions. Um, the Joseph Institute for Ethics uh, conducted extensive international research, which led to the conclusion all kinds of people everywhere agree on a core set of values um, as humans working together. And this is what Josephson called the pillars of character. And these universal values became the basis for creating this common set of ethical principles that we apply when we're trying to figure out what's the right thing to do in a situation. And so a lot of professions have developed their codes of ethics based on these values. Um, and, and that's what we're using as well. So what I'm gonna do over the next few slides is I'm gonna take you through these five values and explain what all of them mean. So let's start with citizenship, okay? So citizenship means that we understand that volunteerism is a foundation of civil societies and it guides organizations towards active community participation. Each of the values is informed by three principles. So for citizenship, the three principles that inform it are a philosophy of volunteerism. And what we do is we encourage every person to have a very clear personal philosophy on volunteerism, why you do what you do. And to support your organization if they don't have one, um, to develop an organizational philosophy on being a volunteer or what volunteer engagement is. The next is social responsibility. And social responsibility means that we work to facilitate compassionate and caring cultures through which community needs are met and shared values are enhanced. And I think the video um, that was shared earlier today does a really good job of what that social responsibility is. And then there's philanthropy, which means that uh, we cultivate a model and, and model the generosity of spirit and time and resources to further the ability for volunteers to do what they need to do and to meet community needs. And really at the center of all, their, of, all of this is that it's not about uh, staff, it's not about volunteers. All of this centers on the community that really needs us um, and the community that we are there to stand beside and to stand with um, and support as, as needed. So let's move on to respect. Respect means that we acknowledge the inherent value, skills, and abilities of everyone. And we affirm that there is a benefit that is gained by volunteers and the organization when we have volunteers uh, working within an organization and partnering with community. The principles that inform this are dignity, inclusivity, and privacy, all really relevant in terms of the conversations that are happening in the United States today. So dignity means that um, no matter who we are, we act in a compassionate manner and we upright, uphold the right of all volunteers to be valued and to be involved in the decisions that affect them. I think that's really, really important in terms of volunteers having meaningful experiences and volunteers having some agency um, over how they will participate, how they will be recognized, all of those different things. Next is inclusivity. And inclusivity means that we aim to have individuals from all backgrounds, ages, perspectives, abilities, experiences, um, that we make sure that all of them are able to participate in volunteerism and that everyone has access to volunteerism. Uh, the reality is it can be really hard 
for everyone to access volunteerism. Um, I think about myself, I'm uh, um, a young working parent and a lot of the places where I would love to volunteer are only open during the times when I work, for example. So I need to be creative and find other ways uh, in which to volunteer. And a lot of organizations are thinking about how can we um, be accessible to all those who want to give their time, but may have different time to give or different skills to give, for example. So that's what we mean by that inclusivity. And privacy means that we protect uh, the privacy of individuals and any information that's considered confidential, which is something that I'm sure that you're all really familiar with. And what I wanna stress here is that privacy is not just about contact information, addresses and phone numbers and, and those kinds of things. Privacy is also about the things that we're honored to learn about people, um, especially in hospice care, things that we learn about people at the end of life uh, people that we learn about the families that love them and are getting ready to say goodbye to them. Those are also the things that we keep confidential, right? And we don't use those stories for fodder or gossip or anything like that. We hold that privacy and we, we, we give dignity to people with that privacy as well. So next is accountability. And accountability means that we demonstrate that we have a responsibility, not only to other volunteers, uh, but to the organization, its stakeholders, um, to other leaders of volunteers, and to the community that we serve. And we do that through collaborating. So that means that we cultivate partnerships to enhance um, the impact that volunteers can have in an organization. Continuous improvement, which all of you are doing today, which means that you pursue excellence in what you do. So that could mean uh, getting certified. It could mean professional development, which is what's happening today. It could mean fostering innovation, right? So hopefully in your breakout groups, you're sharing thoughts and ideas, quotes that resonate with you, um, experiences that make you better at what you do and build your competency as, as volunteers um, in this field. Um, and so that's that continuous improvement. It's not for, you know, it's not just about showing up and, and taking a shift and doing that work. It's also about becoming the best volunteer that you can be and uh, picking up experiences and doing more as you move along. And then next is professionalism. Provide, providing outstanding service to your organization and the people that it serves and upholding and being aware of your personal and your professional boundaries in these interactions. So then we have fairness, which means that you commit to individual and collective efforts to build a fair and a just organizational culture. How do we do that? So we do that by being unbiased and objective when we work with people. So that's that impartiality. We do that with an equity lens, right? So we ensure that everyone has access to whatever resources we have, uh, whether that's um, volunteers, whether that's our time, whatever the resources that we have, we make sure that people have access to them. And especially we make sure that volunteers have access to the resources that they need so that they can be successful in doing their work. And then lastly, it's justice, right? We want to make sure as volunteers and as leaders of volunteers that we're part of a system that has open and consistent processes um, that help to inform decision making and then address any discriminatory or prejudicial behaviors. Last is uh, in that acronym of CRAFT is the T, T for trust. Um, and this just means that we maintain loyal and trusting relationships with all of the people that we work with. And we want to make sure that we're providing a safe environment based on standards of practice. We do this with honesty, right? So we try to be transparent and honesty in our work and honest in our work um, through integrity. So there's a consistency between our words and our actions. We practice ethical decision-making, which we're gonna go through today. And then we also address any conflicts of interest that come up, right? That's all part of living that value and principle of integrity. And then lastly um, is commitment, right? So we act in a manner with sincere good intent and follow through on any promises or agreements that we've made. So this has been a really quick walkthrough of the values and the principles of um, the profession. And it, it's a lot to think about. Um, and I'm sure many words are familiar to you and not surprising to you because a lot of this language does appear in many other codes of uh, conduct or codes of ethics. And that's a good thing. Um, here, it's been tailored to our work um, as volunteers or working with volunteers, working together. And what I do is I just strongly encourage you to take future opportunities to walk through uh, these values and these principles to talk about how each one relates to your work on the ground. And some of them will have resonated more with you in terms of your interactions on a daily basis and others um, 
might not. So those ones that resonate a little bit more with you, try to create some future opportunities to go through what those are. All right. So I want to share a process with you for making ethical decisions. But first, as a reminder, what I want to tell you is that not all situations are ethical dilemmas. Um, sometimes we're just in a in what I call like a yucky or like a sticky situation. It's awkward, um, can be disappointing, but that doesn't mean it's an ethical dilemma. And it's really important um, to remember that ethical dilemmas have specific characteristics, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a few questions on the slide here. If you answer uh, yes to most of these questions, you probably are in, in an ethical dilemma, okay? So keep in mind these characteristics. Ethical dilemmas are rooted in a very specific context or situation, okay? If there's a situation that's happening over and over and over again, it's not an ethical dilemma. It's probably a situation where you need to update a policy or you need to make sure that you get uh, new training um, or um, a policy is there, but it's not understood well or it's not being practiced well, okay? So if a situation is happening over and over again, that's not an ethical dilemma. That's just a, that's just something that needs to be corrected, like a management issue, for example. Um, so an ethical dilemma is very unusual. It's very specific. An ethical dilemma also involves a conflict between two or more of those values and principles that we just quickly went over, okay? An ethical dilemma involves the claims of multiple stakeholders, okay? So it's not just something that you're sitting with that feels strange to you. There are multiple stakeholders involved in an ethical dilemma. In an ethical dilemma, a policy might say, um, in an ethical dilemma, there might be a policy that says you need to do this, um, but it may not feel right in every situation that there is, okay? And so there are there's this kind of like, yes, but that doesn't sound right. That keeps popping up in your head um, when you have an ethical dilemma, that, that, there, that there is a policy in place, but it doesn't seem right for the situation. It needs to be looked at again. And then lastly, when there is an ethical dilemma, there might be a downside to making the correct choice, right? You don't, there is not a perfect decision in an ethical dilemma. Um, and I'll go through that with you as well. There might be a downside. Somebody might be disappointed. Somebody might not get their way, especially because there's multiple stakeholders involved, okay? So when you're confronted with what feels like an ethical dilemma, there are five uh, steps that we recommend that people follow. And by the way, what I want to let you know is that this process, it's not unique to the Council for Certification and Volunteer Administration. You're going to find similar processes explained in a lot of other sources. And the reason is, is that it really works. Okay. It's an, uh, it's a very effective process and it's a very helpful process for a few reasons. One is that when you go through this process, it promotes a very full understanding of the situation. So you're not just reacting in the moment, you're taking time to get a full understanding of the situation. When you go through this process, it avoids any like knee-jerk reactions based on your personal ethics or based on your personal bias. It forces us to pause and to take time to think before we take any action. Um, another thing is that the process also encourages creative thinking and, uh, and looking at multiple perspectives about possible solutions, okay? So it, it, it makes, it forces us not just to go with our gut reaction, but to think of many different possible ways that we could come out of the situation, um, have some creative thinking and think of different perspectives. And, and sometimes perspectives we might not have been able to come up with on our own. This process also um, gives you a safe way to explore all of those options without causing harm to anyone. Um, before you make that decision. And that's using something called the click test, which I'm gonna take you through as well. Finally, when you follow these steps, they result in a decision that's defensible, right? If someone questions your final action or your response to a situation, you can present your rationale. You can take them through the steps and explain why you made the decision that you made, especially because, and I'll remind you, um, there is no 100% right decision. We all have a different ethics backpack, right? But we do, by going through this process, have a defensible decision to talk about our thought process and how we got to the decision that we got to, okay? So when we have these ethical dilemmas, it's, it's natural for all of us, um, especially because we're all people who value helping others, right? And who see um, great power and great privilege in being able to be a helper. We always, you know, we want to find the right answer. We want to do the right thing. 
And the reality is that each situation is unique. And often the course of action that we decide to take, it could have some negative consequences that are unavoidable. Um, and so these dilemmas are valuable learning opportunities. The goal, the goal that we have in mind is that we want to make the best decision based on the best information that we can get. We want to be clear why we're making the decision that we're making, and we want to be prepared for any potential negative implications, okay? Perfection is not going to be an option um, when you make an ethical decision. All right, so let's go through these steps, gathering information, identifying the conflict, exploring options, deciding and testing, and then putting them into action. So when we go through the decision-making steps and we gather information, at this point, we're asking ourselves questions. How did we get into this situation? Who's involved in this situation? What else do I need to know that I might not know, okay? We are asking uh, questions like, um, you know, what, what have I heard that's evidence? What have I heard that's just hearsay? Uh, what's unique about this situation? What other perspectives um, would be useful to know? Are there any relevant policies that would be useful to know? Okay, that's what we're doing when we're gathering information. We are taking into account the personal reaction that we had, but then we are going outside of ourselves and looking for as much information outside of that personal reaction as we can get. How did we get here? Who's involved? What else do I need to know? The second thing that we need to do is we need to name the conflict that is at the heart of the situation. And we do that by identifying what the ethical dilemma is. So what ethical values and principles are actually involved? What is the actual conflict? We're asking ourselves more questions at this stage, like who's gonna be most affected by the decision that I make? Uh, where exactly is the tension? And this is when you wanna consult your organization's code of ethics, as well as your personal ethics and your professional ethics, because naming what the dilemma is, is what's going to take you through the next, um, the next steps in reaching your decision. Okay. So you name what the dilemma is, you name what those uh, values are that are in conflict. And then this is the fun part. You're going to explore all the various options and the consequences of how you could respond to a situation. So think about Lynn at the hospital that we talked about at the beginning of the situation. Um, what, you know, at this point, Lynn is thinking, what if I did this? What if I didn't do that? Who's going to be affected? Um, you're imagining the possible pros and cons of every action you could take. You're thinking about, are there legal implications? Are there policy implications? Ultimately, you're looking for the, the path of least harm, but rarely is nobody harmed in at least some way, even if it's just a little bit of a ruffled ego or a bruised ego, okay? Then you're going to make a decision and you're going to test it, okay? You're going to seek the path of least resistance. And the way that you do this is, so for example, you might have four or five possible options that you're thinking of. I could, I could do one of four things in responding to this ethical dilemma. What you're going to do is you're going to take each of those decisions through what we call the click test, okay? I love the click test because it helps us to become really clear about which of our situations in, in which response is one that we're going to be more um, comfortable with. Okay. So the click test asks us to consider five things that make up the acronym click. First is the consequence. What is the consequence if I make this decision? Who benefits and who suffers? Okay. There might be some consequences that you're okay with happening, right? You might be okay with one person doing better out of a situation and one person maybe not coming out of a situation. A bit better. If you're a parent and you have more than one kid, you know that this happens all the time when your kids want to do different things. You have to decide one over the other. Um, legal, you're going to think about, are there any legal consequences if I make this decision and am I okay with that? Okay. Um, you know, am I okay with um, the fact that my organization might be uh, doing something or I might be doing something uh, and I'm willing to stand behind it, okay? And there's there we see this example a lot in terms of people who stand up for what they believe in, who may protest, who may do uh, different things to voice their opinion, and are okay with, excuse me, what one what those com those consequences might be. Then you're going to think about image, okay? Would I be comfortable seeing this decision announced in the newspaper, on the local news, um, on Facebook? in my WhatsApp group, you know, uh, on Instagram, on TikTok, is this a decision that is going to hurt or harm my, my image or my public image or the image of the volunteer group that I'm part of or the organization that I'm part of? 
Um, would I be comfortable with that? Would I stand behind this decision? Um, would I be willing to face um, some backlash about this decision? Um, would this decision actually make us look really good, put us in a favorable light? These are all of the things that you're thinking about. Then you're gonna think about culture. Does this decision support or damage the culture of the organization that I work or volunteer in, okay? This is really important, especially as volunteers or as leaders of volunteers, because when you make a decision to benefit one volunteer or another, you've got to think about how that affects your other volunteers, how that affects the staff who partner with them or the community that they serve. So you're thinking about that as well. And then is the last piece, which is the not. And I think this piece is really important because this is where we do allow our personal ethics and our personal bias to show up a little bit because it's important to acknowledge all the aspects of who we are in making a decision. And so we're asking ourselves at this point, does this action cause a knot in my stomach, okay? It's that gut level physical reaction that you have. For some of you, it might be that you break out into a sweat, you might get flushed red cheeks, for me, it's in my stomach. When I'm uncomfortable about something or I'm making a difficult decision, I have a bit of a knot in my stomach. You want to ask yourself at this stage, you know, uh, would my kids approve of me making this decision? Would my colleagues and my peers and other volunteers or other staff approve of, of this decision that I make? And how does it make me feel, whether that's a yes or a no, for example, okay? So you take each of those options that you had in terms of how you would respond to an ethical dilemma, you take them through this click test. And that really helps you to become clear in terms of what you're willing to stand behind or what uh, the negative implications might be and how you would prepare yourself for them. And then the last step, right, is that you're gonna pick, you're gonna have to make a decision and you're gonna have to pick um, which uh, step um, that you you know which step are you going to take and and you're going to act at that point with a lot of confidence and with a lot of courage and professionalism again i'll say that there may not be a hundred percent guarantee that you've made the right decision but you are able to defend and justify your actions because going through these steps you have followed a very rational and a thoughtful process and you've taken into account all of the contents of your ethical backpack your professional ethics, you have thought about policy, culture, your organizational ethics, and you've thought about that not in your stomach. So you have given a little bit of time to think about your personal ethics and your personal reactions as well. Okay. We do have a tool on our website and I'll send this out, especially after today's session as well by email, which is a decision-making worksheet that helps you to come up with all of the different um, possible actions and responses. Um, and what you're doing here is you're being, you're able to document your thought process in case you need to review it, you know, um, or you need to share it, or you need to um, defend what your decision is. You, you have it there fresh uh, to be able to look at. And some people will ask me, um, you know, what do I do with this worksheet, right? So um, I've gone, I've, I've had a really tough decision that I've had to make. Um, I use this worksheet, like, you know, what do I do with it? And I always say to people, like, follow your organization's record keeping policies and procedures, make sure you file this wherever it needs to be filed. Um, but also keep a copy for yourself if you're allowed to, without any identifiers or anything like that, so that you have it there, um, just to help build your ethical confidence, um, and your moral courage as you go through a another ethical dilemma down the road. It's a, a piece of, a piece of a tool that you can revisit um, down the road. Okay, so let's go back uh, to thinking about Lynn and I'll just recap her situation. So Lynn is the director of volunteer services at a hospital as we uh, talked about. She's asked um, to organize this clinic for COVID vaccines for volunteers. It's based on her government's phasing criteria. Um, and this is a case study from summer of 2021 when we were just starting to uh, be able to give out vaccinations to staff and volunteers in, in a lot of hospital, hospice, and healthcare settings. And the vaccination supply was not guaranteed. So as she's setting up this clinic, uh, one of her colleagues, the VP of development or fundraising is another way to say that, he asked her to invite a hospital donor to get vaccinated. And Lynn says, you know, this clinic is only for volunteers. Uh, and the VP says, well, Mrs. Smith has dedicated lots of time and we can't disappoint her. What do you think Lynn should have done? So I'll invite you just to come off mute if you'd like to. Um, I'll, I'll pause.
pause my screen share for a moment. You can come off mute uh, or you can let me know in the chat. But if you were Lynn, what, what, what might you have done in this situation? And I'm just going to remind you, there's no wrong answers. Remember, we all have our own backpacks, right? And we have our, we all have our own way in which we might respond to something. And all of those are valid. And uh, being able to share and talk about how we might react to something um, is, is really important in. I see a hand. Is that Julie raising your hand? Or yes. Hi, Julie. Yes. Um I'm, I've just been thinking, um, to me, it seems that you have to think of, you know, the repercussions of the decision. Um, could you be creating, you know, a can of worms where all of a sudden a lot of people that have contributed a lot that are not part of the volunteer team um, could feel they're just as entitled and, um, you know, if it's just stated that it's for volunteers only, and um, I think it kind of needs to stay that way. Um, again, I, I come from a management supervisory background. Yeah. So um, I'm more than willing to ask people what they think and everything. But when I look at um, the whole picture, it's almost like, wouldn't people think, you know, that I'm favoring this person and maybe it's money they've given us or something like that. And um, we want to keep them happy, but at the same time, um, you know, let them know that, and they should know they're the, and we should let them know that they're very much appreciated. But in this instance, you know, um, this is for volunteers and we will look for something um, and let them know as soon as we know when um, the vaccinations would be open to them. Um, because we don't, there'd be so many, I don't know. I think there'd be a lot of negative repercussions from it. Yeah, I like that. I like about the way that you're thinking of it down the road and not necessarily just like a personal um, reaction. I wanna just uh, let you know a couple of things that are in the chat. So Barbara E says, um, Barbara E says, it goes against the fairness pillar. It is a lack of equity. And Judy Lundahl, I hope I said your name correctly, says it was highly inappropriate for the VP of development to ask this of an employee. Uh, Patton asks a really good question. Patton Carter, are there any other sources for a vaccine? Um, and Linda Douglas says, I would want to process this decision, this decision with my immediate supervisor, who I assume is not um, the VP of development. So um, these are really good because this is showing how you're all asking um, different questions of where you could gather information. Um, and Cindy says, wouldn't it be going against the professional code of ethics? It, it might be, absolutely, yeah. Does anybody else want to add anything that you might be thinking of about this situation or how you might handle it? Okay, so let me take you through... Um, I wanna take you through what Lynn did at the time, okay? So for Lynn in that step one, it was gathering information, right? So Lynn is asking, at this point, Lynn is asking, so who was ultimately responsible for the distribution of vaccines at the hospital, right? Perhaps, you know, this is not actually a decision Lynn can make. Perhaps um, this is something that she has to defer to somebody else. She wants to be very clear about that. She also wants to find out, are there clear guidelines for distribution? At the time, everything was happening so fast and so furious. Um, you had people um, on very different spectrums, right? People who were very much clear that they were not comfortable uh, having to get a vaccine in order to continue volunteering. You had people who just couldn't wait to get back to volunteering um, and wanted to have the vaccine to just get past that barrier to be able to get back to doing service. There was people in between who weren't sure, wanted more information. At the same time, there was, uh, you know, policies and procedures, things were being written so fast and things were changing really quickly too, right? So what were those 
clear guidelines, Lynn wants to find that out as well. So she's being very practical with those first two questions. She wants to understand a little bit more, right? Has the VP discussed this request with anyone else? Has this already been approved maybe by the board or somebody else? Or is this something that they are doing um, unethically themselves, trying to just appease this volunteer and, and maybe they got a call from, sorry, this donor, maybe they got a call from this donor and are just reacting and wanted to just see if they could, you know, get them into the clinic really easily. Um, Lynn also in this sec in this this part of her process is asking some of those questions that Julie asked, right? Like what happens if you prioritize someone based on something other than that criteria that's established? What are the consequences that could happen there, okay? Um, might I run out of vaccines? Am I opening up that can of worms? How would my volunteers feel if they knew that they had, you know, for those that had been waiting to come back and volunteer, if they knew that somebody else was given some preferential treatment? What would that do to the morale and to that culture of volunteerism? What would that do with my trust with, volunteer, with my volunteers as well, okay? Um, that's what Lynn is thinking about. And then Lynn is also thinking about who are all the stakeholders that are involved in this decision-making? The hospital, you know, whatever decision she makes, it reflects on the hospital, the CEO, the board of directors. It also will affect other uh, volunteers, the community at large, um, the community outside of uh, where Lynn is, but also the community members that are inside the hospital where Lynn is, okay? And then Lynn herself, what is a decision that she's going to be feeling okay to make? Then she is moving on to the next step, which is to identify the conflict. And for her, some of you already got these that this in the chat and identified it, but for her, the core values at the heart of the dilemma were fairness, right? The idea of equity and justice, and then also trust and, and, and um, the principle of integrity. She's also thinking about accountability and professionalism because at the time when Lynn was gathering information, she wasn't the only one um, who was running uh, clinics and the decision that she made could also affect um, how another hospital might react or how what expectations might be of volunteers or donors at, at another hospital or another campus, for example. So the main conflict for Lynn is that Lynn is being asked to give preferential treatment to someone based on their financial contributions and not their eligibility. And in doing so, she's being asked to inconsistently apply the rules. And for her, that is the conflict and that's the rub. And that is what she's going to use to make her decision going forward. So if she's questioned, she's going to say, this is what I saw as the issue. And this is how I, I dealt with it. And um, these are the steps that I took. So, so the conflict is very clear for her. So Lynn had, and I, I only put five here, but Lynn had explored lots of possible actions and outcomes. The first was, fine, I'll invite Mrs. Smith to the vaccination clinic. You know, maybe one of the consequences or outcomes is that she gives a large donation, okay? Uh, maybe I invite her to the clinic and one of the consequences is she starts telling her friends and other people and word spreads and now uh, her husband wants to come to the clinic, her neighbor wants to come to the clinic, um, uh, one of her best friends will now wants to come to the clinic, all right? So word spreads, that could be a possible consequence, you know, how do we prepare for that? Um, maybe Mrs. Smith does meet the current criteria. So Lynn says, maybe I'm going to ask, go straight to Mrs. Smith myself and ask her if she, maybe she meets the current criteria. If she does, great, I'll include her. If she doesn't, I have that information for sure. Um, Lynn could also just decline to invite Mrs. Smith. She doesn't meet the criteria and that's that. It's as simple as that. Uh, the consequences could be that she makes that VP angry or faces uh, consequences um, from upsetting a senior staff member. The other thing is that Lynn declines to invite Mrs. Smith. She's very clear about her decision-making. Someone may go over her and invite her anyway, but then that decision is not Lynn's, right? Somebody else is responsible um, for any of the consequences that result from that decision, okay? What does Lynn do? She then takes all of these options and she puts them all through the click test. And then she makes a decision. She acts with confidence, courage, and professionalism. So let me tell you what Lynn decided to do in the end. So in the end, what Lynn decided to do is um, she decided not to invite Mrs. Uh, Smith to the clinic. She got some time with her with the VP and she just explained that she had thought through the situation. She had thought through the consequences of what might happen if they did allow Mrs. Smith into the clinic. She talked about the potential um, you know, that that can of worms could be opened, right? And that Mrs. Cl Mrs. Smith might uh, take that privilege and 
assume that others could have it as well, right? And, or, uh, you know, even worse, somebody might say, I'll make a donation if you let me have the, the, the vaccination, right? At the time of this happening as well, there were um, some pharmacists and some medical professionals who were um, uh, 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 who were running COVID vaccination clinics for healthcare professionals. And at the end of the day, there would be vaccine that had been opened and left over. And if it wasn't used, they would have to throw it out. And so they would just call whoever they knew and they would say like, if you want to get the vaccine, come and get it. Otherwise I have to throw this out. In their mind, they didn't want it to go to waste. Um, but some media outlets picked that up and a few people lost their jobs doing this because they were accused of um, giving preferential treatment to people that they knew, family members or friends. Um, and, you know, whatever their intention was or was not, the consequence was that it damaged the image um, of those medical professionals. For some of them, they lost their jobs, other, other ones faced fines. And so Lynn was able to explain this to the VP as well. Um, so what happened was Lynn was prepared to face some negative consequences, right? She was prepared for the VP to be angry. She was prepared for him to go over her head and try to get this uh, donor to be vaccinated anyways. What ended up happening is Lynn took the time to go through that thoughtful process and that VP had not taken the time to go through that thoughtful process. And he really thanked Lynn. He was feeling under pressure. So what had actually happened is Mrs. Smith had called and said, oh, I hear there's a vaccination clinic. You know, my friend is a volunteer at the hospital and she got an email saying she could come and get vaccinated. Could I just, you know, get vaccinated too? And she had put the VP in an uncomfortable position and he hadn't really thought it through, uh, but Lynn had done that for him. And Lynn, in going through her process, she actually was able to give the VP some, some language that he could go back and talk to Mrs. Smith about as well. She acted with that confidence. She acted with that courage and she acted with that professionalism. So at the end of the day, she made a decision that she was really happy with. Um, the negative consequence, obviously, is that Mrs. Smith is not going to get her way. And as I said, there's no 100% a guaranteed solution, right? So Lynn made a solution that she felt worked for her personally, worked for the organization, the CEO, the board of directors, the reputation, the culture, um, and the other volunteers that she's uh, responsible for. Um, and, you know, Unfortunately, that VP is probably going to have an uncomfortable conversation with Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Smith isn't going to get her way. So everybody is not happy at the end of the situation. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, she's also gained the confidence of a member of the senior management team and just demonstrating her professionalism. And she ended up having this ally on the senior leadership team um, that really, um, it really elevated her role in, in, in the role and respect um, and the profile of, of her and of the volunteers that are in the organization as well. So I say all of this, um, I say all of this to say to you that um, making ethical decisions requires moral courage. And I really like this quote by Rushworth Kidder of the uh, Institute for Global Ethics. It says that moral courage is the quality of mind and spirit that enables one to face up to ethical dilemmas and moral wrongdoings firmly and confidently without flinching or retreating. Because in our personal life, in our personal ethical backpack, our initial reaction for some of us might be to flinch or retreat. But when you work on your ethical decision-making, when you treat it like something that you're constantly working on and building that muscle, um, it's that spirit that enables you to face up to that firmly and confidently. Um, and it's hard work, right? learning that skill and that process of ethical decision making, it does help you to build that courage. It does help you to build that confidence. And at the end of the day, we do all of this, right? We try to be better at what we do because we want to serve our community in the best way possible. So there are ways that you can exercise your ethics, um, just like you would exercise your mind and your body uh, in different ways, you can also exercise your ethics. So you, you'll get a uh, sheet uh, after today called the CCVA Values and Principles, and that's CRAFT and the C-R-A-F-T. It'll be the values and all of those principles explained. It's all on one page. So you can post that or just have that available to you or just look at it every once in a while, especially when something happens that you're not quite sure. Was that an ethical dilemma or just an awkward situation? Um, you will have that. Um, you might want to discuss ethics at um, staff or volunteer orientations or when you're um, 
with other volunteers or with other staff, especially if something comes up and you're not quite sure about it, you might want to make sure that you have a place um, where you can talk about these things. You can use scenarios just like Lynn's as a discussion starter to practice the decision making process. And at CCVA, we have dozens of case studies as well that we can share with you. If you want to use those scenarios as a discussion starter, you can just reach out to me and I can send those to you. Um, you can devote time at meetings to focus on ethical principles. Um, and you could also just find other colleagues, other volunteers, family members, community members to serve as your sounding board. I think for me, when I've gone through ethical decision making, the most important aspect and the strongest part of my gathering information stage is going to other colleagues and um, letting them know the situation, being honest about what my personal reaction is and having them reflect back to me or validate the things that I'm feeling or, you know, call me out and say, that's your bias at play there, Faisa. Like, you know, um, your, your bias is informing your initial reaction and here's what my initial reaction is. And sometimes, it's funny, it can be really different. I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting or a situation, even like around the dinner table with family, where somebody says something and you have a reaction to it, but when you look around the table, like nobody else seems to have a reaction to it. Um, and, and I find my sounding board is really important um, because it gets me to think about an opinion other than myself. And I don't center myself um, and my own ego or my own experience. I'm open then to other ideas and opinions. Um, so that's really, really important, having that sounding board. After today, if ethics is something that you're excited about, I get excited about ethics just because I think it, it directly relates to how well we can serve the community that we serve. Um, if you're interested in more of these resources, you can go to the CCVA website. Um, it's cvacert.org, and there's an ethics section there. The independent sector is also another uh, website that you can go to if you search ethics and accountability in their resources section. Um, there's a lot of materials there in understanding ethics better. Um, and then the Josephson Institute of Ethics also has a ton of information. And as I said, this is where a lot of organizations and a lot of professions that have ethical processes, procedures, a lot of them are uh, based on the work of Josephson. There's also a free booklet. You can Google it. It's called The Complete Eth Guide to Ethics Management by Carter McNamara. It's like a free 20-page booklet, and it takes you, um, whether you manage people or not, I don't think it, it, it matters. It's just good even on an individual basis. It's a free booklet that you can print out and you can go through in terms of thinking about ethics um, even more. Um, so I like to leave some time um, at the end of the session for anyone that has any questions. Maybe there's an ethical dilemma um, that has come to mind um, for you um, that you want to discuss or you want to talk about. I'm just going to close my slides. Um, if there's a situation that you're a part of or, or anything that you want to talk about, this is a, a great time for us to do that. Um, I'm just going to see what we missed in the chat. I'll just read to you a little bit um, about some of those uh, answers that were coming in uh, the chat. Cindy says, uh, Cindy had said, I think I mentioned this, wouldn't it be going against the professional code of ethics in Lynn's situation? Donna says, there's a government policy with a specific age requirement that would have to be violated. Um, Lori says, as part of info gathering, I try to find out how many potential donors there are that would want a vaccine. I would also look at the goal of volunteers probably somewhere is a reference to the goal of caring for current patients. And I like how you, um, Lori, have a very practical way of thinking about it, but you've also centered the, the, the caring of the parents, of the patients, because that's really what it's all about. And Susan's very clear, this person does not meet the criteria for a volunteer. Paul Hennigan says, please pass this request to my supervisor and I will act on my supervisor's direct response. And that's great, except, you know, if you want to be seen as a leader and, um, you know, you're not comfortable making the decision on your own, that's a good way to do it. But also these tools are available to help you to make the decision on your own, um, not have to go to your, to your supervisor. Uh, Don Boyer says, I would stick to the rules and policies, but would acknowledge the higher ups desire to recognize the donor and present some other creative way to do so that is not in conflict with policies, etc., or that could hurt the hospital in different ways, legally, image, fairness, etc. And Bobby asks a question. 
does her age or disability allow her to get vaccinated somewhere else? These are a great question in that gathering info stage, right? Um, and that might be something that Lynn says to the VP, right? Like if this is a request that you want to help Mrs. Smith with, we can't do it here, but maybe you could find out if she could get uh, vaccinated somewhere else. Catherine Mernon says, I think she made the right decision when was able to defend it well. And Cindy says, what about the click page? It's gonna be in the slides that you get, Cindy, after today. The click page will be there. And Judy says, would you send us the list of the ethics resources you mentioned? Yes, you're gonna get a copy of all the slides today. And that list of resources will be there as well. So does anyone else have any um, questions or any other anything else that they'd want to uh, talk about if there's an ethical dilemma that you might have faced that you want to let us know about or one that you're you're sort of noodling around in your in your head at the moment. Catherine says, what would you have done, Faiza? Um, I'll be honest with you, Catherine, I am like a recovering people pleaser. This, this would have been a situation that really stressed me out. I would have had that knot in my stomach um, because it's um, what I have found as a leader of volunteers is that I can be the best advocate for my volunteers when the staff that I partner with value volunteers. And it's really important for me to develop relationships internally with other staff. So that would have really stressed me out, the request coming from another staff. The first thing that I would have done, Catherine, is I would have gone to my sounding board um, and I would have explained the situation. I would have explained why I was feeling comfortable. Um, I probably would have done a lot of research and trying to solve the VP's problem, right? Like I would have probably tried to find out where else are there clinics, where else could Mrs. Smith get vaccinated? Um, so that instead of just saying no, I would say no with the solution. Lynn is just way more practical. Lynn, that's not her real name, as I said, but she's way more practical, less of a people pleaser than me. Um, but Lynn was just very firm in her no and, and didn't go that extra step of trying to make that solution. Um, for Mrs. Smith. I just know that I, I would have done that because um, in the organizations that I've worked at, are the relationships that staff have with each other reflect on the volunteer. So if staff don't like working with me, you volunteers will often feel that and they'll get an attitude from staff or whatnot. If staff like me, they're often uh, willing to you know, take on a new volunteer or try different things and have a lot of esteem and recognition and, and appreciation for what volunteers do. And that's just very specific to the context um, that I worked in. Uh, Don says, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Don. And Pat and Carter says, it's very helpful to have a tool to break down a scenario to process together and not alone and remembering that I'm not alone. Yeah, and I love that. I love that those five steps and I love that click test. I think that click test is something you can use not only in ethical dilemmas, I use it when my husband and I are disagreeing about something as well. Hey, what does the, what, what are the consequences? You know, I'll use that click test for a lot of different things. So if the donor gets angry and decides I'm gonna pull out and and not donate anymore and all those funds are going to go away what how do you think management would respond um upper management it's such a good question bobby because when lynn was going through her decision making process one of the things she did is she planned for that right she said i might decline to invite mrs smith but the vp might offer give it to her anyways right the vp might be the one that does that says yes anyways and at the end of the day if then there was a harmful Facebook page or a news story or whatnot, it wouldn't come down to Lynn being responsible for that and it wouldn't reflect on the volunteers, right? And um, you know, if, if, if for example, say that scenario happened, Bobby, where um, Lynn says no, but then the VP says, well, I'm gonna invite her anyways, right? Um, and then Mrs. Smith comes and then Mrs. Smith, you know, inadvertently tells somebody and they get wind of it and they post on, they go on Facebook and they say, Oh my God, I was just at, um, you know, I was just at the library and I heard two of my neighbors talking about how this one got a vaccination at the, this hospital. You know, it's not up to Lynn to then defend that situation. The hospital has their own situation. The fact is like Lynn did make the decision. Lynn broke it down and, and did say that these consequences uh, were some of the consequences. Um, and, you know, she, she, at least she can feel good about the decision that she made and she has that defensible decision. 
what, in this situation, what was great is that she did that thinking for that VP. Uh, Lori says, just as the VP hadn't thought through the consequences, maybe Mrs. Smith hadn't either. Lynn's process will help the VP to talk to Mrs. Smith and explain the impact on the hospitals and patients. <laughs> and Mary says, my thought process says, don't come up with the problem, come up with the solution. Absolutely. I love that. Um, I love the way that you say that, Mary. Like, it's, don't just identify the dilemma, which is, you know, step two, but also come up with the solution as well. Thanks for your question, Bobby. I think one of the important things in this situation would be to get as many people involved and perspectives as possible so that you're not making a decision in a vacuum. I think that's a really good point, Eric, especially because, um, and what we said about air, um, ethical dilemmas, right, is that they involve multiple stakeholders, right? And so in this situation, you can see how quickly this can become and involve multiple stakeholders. I think something we may not think about all of us, just depending on our in our work or how we use technology or tools, is that we may not be on Facebook or TikTok or do those kinds of things. Um, for example, I'm not on TikTok. I, I don't um, know much about it. I'm curious about it. I might learn. But sometimes the things that we do, we the, the fact is that we live in a world where so much is recorded now and where people can just um, say what they want to say on their own pages and people are not checking the validity of those stories, right? Like they're not checking their facts, they're not checking the validity. We are in a, in a world now where we create our friends on Facebook or um, Instagram or whatnot, and we have trust, especially if they're family and they're people that we care about, right? So I can't tell you the number of times my mom has sent me like a news story and been like, watch out for this. And then I'll say, mom, it's just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. And She'll be like, but so-and-so sent it to me. It's her sister or it's somebody that she goes to the mosque with that she trusts. And I'll say, it doesn't matter if so-and-so sent it to you. Like she'll, she'll often send me things like, you must drink this much turmeric in order to you know, deal with this thing. And I'll say, mom, your sister sent it to you. Like your sister was a, is not a doctor. Like she saw it online. She has no medical like background and have to walk her through that process. But that's the reality of the world that we live in today. And sometimes one small comment can get blown up and you, you guys have heard of viral moments that happen, right? And so one small thing can, can be really blown up. And that's why I love that click test because that image part of that click test forces us to think about the repercussions of it. The other <laughs> flip side of it is that sometimes you get to see these really beautiful heartwarming moments because of TikTok and video. And sometimes you capture something really genuine and beautiful and those moments um, can go viral as well. I don't know how many of you have ever been like scrolling and I'll, I'm like such a softie that I'll scroll through things and, you know, I'll see this beautiful video of like a kid at school and her dad's in the military and comes and surprises her in the lunchroom and I'm just crying and I'm bawling. You capture those moments as well too. So there's a, there's a balance. Um, uh, that happens I, find there. This, I find this case study very, very interesting, but, um, and one of the things is remembering back to that time frame when the vaccine was new and only a certain number of people could get it. It was a very high emotional state yes. of, of people wanting the vaccine. And um, uh, when, when emotions get high like that in, in trying to make a good ethical, logical decision, sometimes gets uh, lost in the, in the fray. Yeah, yeah. There is another ethical dilemma I'll share it with you that, that one of our CBAs shared with us. And that was, um, so she was the director of volunteers and this was in 2022. She was placing volunteers with different staff partners that were gonna be working with them. And one of her, and her organization did not have a mandate that volunteers had to be vaccinated. She worked at a humane society. So the, Volunteers do work with other staff and community members, but primarily they're there to take care of the animals. Um, but one of her staff said to her, I will only work with volunteers who have been vaccinated. Um, and the ethical dilemma there, there were so many different things that she was facing, but one is A, there's no mandate for staff or volunteers to be vaccinated where she worked. B, 
um, it's actually none of her business whether the volunteers have been vaccinated or not. That's their personal medical information. That's not something that she was going to all of a sudden introduce into her um, interviewing or screening of volunteers. Um, and that, you know, that staff person, she was expressing concern as someone who's immunocompromised, that that was something that was really important to her because she's worried about working with staff or volunteers who hadn't been vaccinated and getting sick. So she had to unpack a lot of things to get through that situation. Um, it consult a lot of different people within her organization because it, it also ended up becoming not just an issue around like fairness and equity for volunteers, but it also became a human resource issue for the staff person, right? To say, um, I only want volunteers uh, who are vaccinated. That's just not the policy of the organization. And, and what does that mean? Do you then expect all staff that you work with to also be vaccinated? Um, so it, it, it ended up being a, a really big situation where lots of people had to be involved. But, you know, I, I bring that situation up, Jane, because so many emotions were involved in that situation. Um, some people were coming to it from a very practical standpoint. Some were coming to it from a very emotional standpoint, and some were just coming thinking about what are the legal, you know, ramifications. What do I? HR was thinking, what do we have to do to protect the staff person? And the volunteer manager was thinking, like, what do I have to do to make sure that everyone has access to come and uh, uh, equitable access to volunteering, um, you know, it, with with the animals that are here. So that those emotions are always something that we have to consider. I, I'm seeing a comparison now, Ken here with mask requirements. Uh, we hear um, recently, um, there are the, uh, re, the the places where we, some of our volunteers were going to see uh, residents required uh, masks upon entry and throughout the visitation. Um, there, were, there was some pushback by a few on on that as well i, I find that it's a it's a very interesting situation uh that we find ourselves in currently as well this is not something that did it's still ongoing uh yeah i'm seeing it here now more so with with the masks i think the vaccinations are are um being handled uh, much more quietly <laughs> I didn't know what your thoughts were on masks or if you shared the same um, uh, click test um, questions for masks being required of some volunteers. You see, it's not the agency's requirement in this case, it's the place where it was the volunteer is going. Yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, that you can't really control that, right? Like you can't control yeah. the, the policies of the agency that you're going into, but what you can do, is when you're recruiting your you as the agency that's recruiting a volunteer you you put that into your guidelines as um you know as a volunteer with our agency you're required to go to other agencies with us we may or may not have a mask requirement but we have to respect the requirements of those other agencies so if wearing a mask is going to be an issue for you let us know we may not assign you to those agencies yeah. or um, we, we don't have the capacity to do that. So if mask wearing is not something that's comfortable for you, then this might not be the volunteer opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. And I want to be really clear that none of us are ever going to be able to create situations where everything is perfectly equitable because at the end of the day, um, we can't be open 24 hours a day, right? So we can't offer ro volunteer roles at the very specific time that every single person wants to do them. Mm -hmm. Um, we also can't take every single person that wants to volunteer with us, right? So in terms of, you know, people say we are inclusive and we're equitable. The reality is we are inclusive and we're equitable to the extent that we can be, we can be equitable based on how we operate as an organization. So for example, we, we want to say we're inclusive, but it may not be appropriate to have a nine-year-old to do certain volunteer um, tasks, right? It may not be, um, ethically responsible for us to have somebody uh, doing tasks like we can't say well everybody is welcome even if you don't have a driver's license you can be a driver like that's not equity right so it is okay for us to have some limits and it is okay for us to say things like that masks might be required or a driver's license is required or the ability to lift 20 pounds is required whatever it is or you might have to have your CPR 
Um, and it, those might be barriers for people who don't have those things, um, but that's okay. It's the same as when you apply for a job. It's there are certain requirements that we that we might have to have. Uh, Eric says, you also had the other side with people not wanting the vaccine and wanting exemption stretched. Absolutely. And that's community members, that's staff, that's volunteers, right? There's th that that's happening where you have some staff who don't want the vaccine, some volunteers who don't want the, the vaccine for whatever reason that, that they may um, that they may have, right? Um, Cheryl says, if you have to wear masks into a nursing home type environment, they do make clear masks that allow for older patients to still be able to lip read or see or smile. Yeah, I've seen some of those. It's Isn't it amazing in 2021, 2020, 2021, everywhere you went, you saw masks. You could get a Star Wars mask. You could get a mask with jewels on it and be dazzled. You could get the, the and then there was like the, the what were they, the a 95, NC95 mask. There was all kinds of different masks. And um, I'm not sure where it's like in your state, but. I'm, in, I'm joining you from California and in California now, all of those things are at the dollar store. These masks that people were paying $25 for, like now they're all trying to get cleared out because there are no mask um, mandates um, in, most air, in most places here. There may be some where there are people who are susceptible um, to germs or bacteria like hospital settings, maybe just specific floors even, uh, but it's funny how quickly masks were a thing and then how quickly they, they um, in my state um, are not necessarily a requirement, especially, uh, and, and vaccines too. My workplace um, was mandating them at one point. And then, you know, six months later, they weren't being mandated anymore because as we got more information that the, those mandates changed. Thank you very much. Right, Isa, thank, thank you so much. It really back. was helpful to have an overview and to have so many examples and, and then also to walk away with a tool that really can be applied to any situation. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I'm seeing in the chat, thank you for a wonderful presentation. All right. So we, um, we may, wrap up just a little bit early today, which is not a bad thing, but we want to take a, a little while now to be able to reflect back on the three weeks that we've had together around this topic of expanding your comfort zone and where the magic happens. Um, and we have a kind of a closing ritual that we have used for the last few years um, to wrap up our, our conferences. And I think that Leslie did put this into the chat. Um, you'll see something that says www.menti.com. So what we're going to be doing is creating a word cloud. Um, I, if you've never done this before, it's the opportunity to for everyone to do a little brainstorming and to share some words that... Um, reflect back on this experience that we've had together. And I'll give you instructions in just a moment. And then what's gonna happen at the end of that process is that Leslie will share an image on the screen that actually takes everybody's thoughts and words and puts them into a, a collective visual. So this is kind of a, a fun and interesting way to wrap this up. So if, if you have the opportunity to click on that um, link in the chat, the www.menti.com, that is a safe link and it will take you to a page where you can begin to enter words. So we want you to reflect on the theme, expanding your comfort zone where the magic happens. And we'd like you to enter words that come to mind as you look at the conversations we've had these last three weeks. And I'm going to suggest that everybody just start by entering the word stretch. That's a, a great first word. And then you can continue to add words. So type in a word, hit the tab, type in another word, hit the tab and add as many as you'd like. So we're gonna take just a few minutes to have everybody brainstorm and, and put these words in. 
If for whatever reason you can't go to that website, you can also put words in the chat and Leslie will be adding those for us. So mm -hmm. let's just take a couple minutes. Could you say again the start word? Stretch. Stretch, okay, thank you. Yeah, so we're stretching outside our, our comfort zone. If you are on multiple devices, you can um, go to menti.com and the code when you get there is 6557-28-26. Um, it's M-E-N-T-I dot com. See you Okay. I'm going to add a couple of words that people put in. Make sure. So I'll just give you another um, tip. If you have a, a small phrase versus a single word, you'll need to add kind of a dash in between those words. So for example, I was adding the word comfort zone. And so I put comfort dash zone so that those appear together. Great, we're, we have 96 responses, so that's good. You guys figured it out. Just job, keep going. I can see it, but you can't. Actually, I'll get, you know what? I'll give you a teaser. I'll show you what it looks like so far. Okay. Tanya, what's that? I'll give them a little teaser of what it looks like so far. Yeah, and it's going to keep changing. So, um, continue to think about what those um, those concepts or thoughts or words have been for you uh, as we have spoken over the last couple of weeks. I'm going to type in those that just came in, but I want to also mention that you did receive, you should have received, an email from me with a link to the presentations for the last couple of weeks. They are all housed on the homecarenh.org slash 2023 volunteer training. I think that's what it says. I'll send you the link again. Um, but it, um, each session has its own tab and then you can rewatch um, or watch for the first time if you're just joining us uh, for today and um, they'll be recorded and housed there for about a year till we do it again. All right, so we'll give it one more minute for you to add any additional words that you want to add and then we'll have kind of this big unveiling where Leslie will show us. What, what we collectively created. All right, I have everything in the chat. Yes, pretty much caught up, all right. So, are we ready to see it? I think we're ready. All right. So, all right, here we go. All right, uh, obviously stretch comes out real big on top here. You guys, that pretty good. I'll zoom in a little bit here. These are, these are such wonderful things. Being present, being totally present, kindness, community, connection, support, confidence, courage, space, magic, listen, care, service, ethics, inspiring, expanding, thoughtful, from the heart, thought-provoking, informative, challenges, sharing. Um, wow. So I think what we will do with this is um, Leslie's going to capture this to save it. And we will be sending this out today at the end. So you're going to walk away with um, an email follow-up that has the link to the film that we watched earlier. It has the presentation that, or it has the, the click um, handout that FISA is sharing with us. Um, and then you'll have this uh, word cloud that this community collectively created. 
And also in that, you'll have the links to the various, um, to all three. In fact, you can go back and listen to any of the three weeks presentations and watch the recording of that. And we wanna ask that um, you make sure that you complete an online evaluation for, for each of the recordings or live presentations that you participated in. So this is all part of the New Hampshire Home Care Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance. And there is a, a group of volunteer coordinators who works throughout the year to plan this session each year. And so um, these volunteer coordinators take quite a bit of time to really think about what might be valuable information for this group uh, and to look for speakers um, that can really bring that to life. And we take your comments and your feedback very seriously. So I do hope that you'll take time to fill in those evaluations. And am I missing anything else? Anybody else from the committee or, or Leslie, anything, any final words before we wrap up? Boy, I think that about covers it. Right. Eric, Ren, missing anything? Lorraine. Lorraine. Ashley. We look forward to seeing you all again in 2024, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for participating. This was so helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.